Hi, my name is Nicole Medor, and I'm the Early Childhood Specialist at the Maine Department of Education. I'm so excited to offer the field an opportunity to learn more about our new open source curriculum, Pre-K for Maine. With the help of a federal grant, Maine was able to partner with experts from around Maine, as well as with staff from the Boston Public School System. Together, we worked to adapt, review, and pilot this curriculum in public pre-K classrooms right here in Maine. Since our pilot year, we've worked to get all of the materials and resources up on our early childhood website, www.maine.gov backslash DOE backslash learning backslash early childhood. Teachers, administrators, families, and child care providers can now access all materials on their own. With that said, there's a lot to know and understand before diving into the implementation of Pre-K for Me. So together with four teachers from RSU 57, we've created this training video. It's important to remember though that we recorded this video during the COVID-19 pandemic. You might hear some questions and suggestions that relate directly to social distancing. In this first clip, you'll hear Melissa Brown briefly discuss the various units and the components of the curriculum. You'll also hear Sarah Smith go into greater detail of intro to centers and centers. Melissa will join us again for thinking and feedback. Uh, so welcome. Um, so a brief introduction for anyone who doesn't know me, there are definitely some familiar faces in the crowd, so you may be uh, you may be familiar with me. Um, so my name is Melissa Brown and I'm one of the pre-K teachers here at R257. I've been here for two years and before that, I mean, I've been in the field of early childhood education for about 20 years. I ran a family home child care for 12 years. I've been an assistant teacher, a lead teacher. I was a director at a learning center in Freeport for several years uh, before coming here to R257. Um, I've also been a member of a school board, so I have an understanding of the like, kind of behind the scenes that happens in the support of the school system. Um, so today I'm going to take you through an overview of the components of the Pre-K for Me curriculum. And over the next two days, we'll go into each component more in depth. If you have questions while we're talking over the next two days, don't hesitate to type them into the Zoom chat box if you're on Zoom or to raise your hand. We're more than happy to answer your questions. If you have questions after your school year starts and you want to reach out, you're worried about a component or you're not sure how to implement an activity, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We are more than happy to help. Um, so in 2005, the Boston Public School Department creates 40 pre-K classrooms across Boston and four curriculum data dot owl for literacy, which you may be familiar with if you're using that in your program already, and building blocks for math. In 2014, they reevaluate their program and they put together a team to expand on OWL so that it is more inclusive across all learning areas. Um, they call that Focus on K-1, and like Nicole said, all of that is open source on their website if you're interested in looking at it. We are using an adapted version of that, so a lot of it is the same. Uh, so the main DOE in the meantime wants to develop an evidence-based curriculum that meets our main base standards, uh, brings experiential play back into the classroom, and prepares children for a successful transition to kindergarten. We're inspired by Boston, and with a grant, we adapt their curriculum for me. So in 2018, we launched the pilot of the program, and last year we did our second year of it. Thank you. And so the guiding principles for the team that put together both the Boston program and the state of Maine program, um, young children are capable of complex higher order thinking. Children are active participants in their learning through all components throughout the day. Meaningful knowledge is constructed through robust interaction and high engagement. And instruction is impactful because teachers become researchers in their classrooms. So pre k for me has six units of study. The first two to three weeks of the school year, you are not starting the curriculum. Um, I think the first year we did it, we took four weeks, and that was a little too long. By the end of the year, we were scrambling to complete unit six. Um, last year, we did two weeks, and that seemed to work out really well. Um, so those first two weeks are for settling in, going over your routines, 
this year, it'll probably be you know, talking about masks and how to line up and all the little things that are going to come through your school district. Um, and then you'll start unit one. And so this one little sentence describer is just a sample concept from each of the units. There's really so much more that goes into it. Uh, but unit one is families. And the idea that a family is a group of people who care about one another. Unit two is friends. And you're exploring the idea that friends might have conflicts with one another and how you peacefully resolve those conflicts. Um, wind and water is unit three. That's my favorite unit. Um, so you're exploring properties of water and wind and how weather affects humans and animals. There's so much critical thinking that's in this unit. They're doing a lot of drawing and writing and observing. And I'm a history English person. I don't super love science, but I love this unit. And so it's just always fun to watch what they do in this unit. At the end of unit three, you do a showcase of learning where you invite your families in. I'm sure it'll look different this year, um, but you invite your families in to see what you've been working on. And the first year I only showed work from unit three, but last year I started collecting work unit one that they could show to their families. Um, the first year we did it right in our classroom and families came into the school and visited with their child and their child showed them their work. Last year we did it on a video. We created a video of our sailboat experiment and set that up for the family. Unit four is the world of color. And by now most of them know the basic color, but they're really exploring colors in their world. They um, are using colors to organize and sort and label the world around them. And they're really getting into the shading and tinting and eventually creating self-portraits and the different shades and colors of our skin and how everyone is different and similar. Um, unit five is shadows and reflections. They're exploring the properties and aesthetics of light, how light affects animals and people, why it's important. And unit six is things that grow. So you're heading into spring, learning about life cycles, learning how plants and animals develop, growing seeds. Um, so I won't read through all these because I'm about to read through them quite in um, but these are all of the components of the pre-K for me curriculum. You can go ahead. So the first one is read aloud. And so the photos that I'm showing today were used with permission, just so everyone's aware. Um, the little girl is actually Jesse's daughter. You're going to see her a lot. <laughs> um, and the little boy is a son of the administrator of the school I work. So read aloud is 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the time of year. At the beginning of the year, you're reading Crybaby, and it's a shorter book, and your discussion might be shorter because they're getting into, you know, what it's like to have a discussion with their peers. But by the end of the year, you're looking at longer discussions, more critical thinking of their answers, um, longer books throughout the year. Uh, it's a full group activity, and the two main goals are vocabulary development and story comprehension. And I will say the resounding feedback from our kindergarten teachers when we sent them off to kindergarten was their comprehension skills. They were just blown away. Their critical thinking, their discussions with one another and with their teacher um, was really impressive. So there are 30 core texts carefully chosen that you'll read throughout the entire course of the curriculum. Um, this does not include support books or other components in the curriculum. Um, so the books were carefully chosen for complex plots, interesting characters, and challenging vocabulary. For the most part, I don't think we changed many books from Boston. There were a few, yeah, that we changed to main authors yeah. um, or specific, um, you know, main, like a lot of the math books. Um, or if a book was out of print now, we didn't include correct. that. Yes. Uh, and we wanted to ensure that all of the books are available through the library system in Maine. So if it's not available in your local town library, you can get it through um, the state library. Yeah. So the next component is intro to centers. Uh, this takes five to ten minutes. It's a whole group activity. Some teachers do read aloud first in their day and then maybe intro to centers. This is how I start my day because before I do, you know, I greet them for the day. Um, we talk about our plans for the day and then I move right into intro to centers. Um, it's a full group activity and every day you are introducing one to three new 
new activities or one to three additions to an activity they're already doing in centers, and then they go off to centers. Um, it's not a circle time, and it, there's no calendar. So I feel like I, there's no calendar in the curriculum. Um, in some of the pictures, you might see a 100-day chart. We count to the 100th day of school at line school where I teach, and so we do that too. I don't stress about it. It's not part of the curriculum. If I think of it, we do it. If I don't, we don't, but we still have a party on the 100th day of school. Um, centers is 60 minutes and um, in full day programs. If you're doing a half day program, you're looking at probably about 45 minutes so that you can fit in as many of the components of the curriculum that you can. And centers in your classroom include blocks, library and listening, so we call it book center in my classroom. Dramatization, that's your dress up area or your kitchen. We usually call it whatever it is at the time. Um, it becomes a kitchen, a grocery store, a barber shop, a flower center, a swamp, <laughs> a habitat of some sort. It becomes a cave for a lion. Um, so we have a writing center, an art studio, an easel. We have a discovery center with your water and sand, and puzzles and manipulatives. And thinking and feedback is a 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the time of year, again, because their attention spans and the uh, quality of the discussions that they're having will improve throughout the course of the year. By the end of the year, the pilot year, my children had a everyone's engaged discussion for about 25 minutes about a topic that they were just really interested in. Um, it's a whole group, and it's discussion of a piece of work in which the students look at the work, notice and share details, listen to their peer talk about the work they created, wonder and ask questions, and give suggestions. Um, small groups. So here in this small group, they are working together to make a pinata. Um, it's about 15 to 20 minutes. And in your group, in your classroom, you'll have three to four small groups. Um, it includes literacy activities, math activities, as well as independent activities that they can do without the support of you or your ed tech. Um, it's separate from centers. So sometimes you get the question of, you know, you can have center time, but then also can you be running small groups? And ideally, no, it's a separate component. You really want to be focused on the skills that they're developing during their small group time. And a lot of hands-on learning experiences. So these guys are working together, teamwork, collaboration, to create the thing that they later get to bash with a stick. <laughs> uh, SWIPL, which stands for Songs, Wordplay, and Letters. Um, it's about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the time of year. It's a whole group activity. And if you're looking for what's the phonics component of the curriculum, this is it. You're building on print and phonological awareness. You're playing word games, singing songs, doing poetry. You're reading predictable texts over and over. Um, you're doing letter names and sounds, matching upper and lowercase letters, beginning and ending letter sounds, and a lot of rhyming. And this is a component where math comes in as well. They're singing math songs, reading counting books, counting everything. <laughs> um, I was say, this is also the piece where if you really love circle time and you've done it for years and years, this is kind of that circle time feel where you're gathering with them and singing songs. Um, so you do have large group activities as a component in the schedule. And once or twice a week, you'll do like find out about it. This is Isabel, Jesse's daughter. Um, so it takes about 10 minutes. It's a whole group activity. And the ideas and lessons that you do during this are pulling from the storybook and from the lessons you've been learning. I think we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, and I'll go more in depth on exactly what you are exploring. Um, so then it's a little easier to understand really what this component is. Um, the other large group activity is at least once a week, if not twice, you're doing a large group math activity. 
um, which is designed to present early math concepts in a sequential manner. It's engaging, it's developmentally appropriate. Um, so there's usually one math large group activity per week, and then you're doing two to three small group math activities, plus you have your puzzles and manipulative center where you have math activities, and you have Swipple where you're offering math learning. Um, storytelling and story acting takes about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the time of the year. This is a component the first year that we didn't offer right away because we really wanted to get the rest of the components well established. So if you take some time and don't offer it right away, I think that's okay. You are doing some story acting in your read aloud component, so they are getting some of that experience. Um, so at the heart of storytelling is listening. The children listen to a child tell a story. Children listen to each other's stories. And this is a component um, that really can help foster the classroom culture that you are building in your classroom because they're listening to each other, they're acting out the stories. It's a lot of fun. If we get through the next two days and you want more information about storytelling or you're really interested in it, I can recommend Vivian Haley, who is an author who used storytelling in her curriculum and um, has several, several books um, kind of detailing the things that she learned about that as she did it. Um, outdoor learning, there is an outdoor learning component to the curriculum, which is so important, especially this year. You're probably going to want to be outside as much as possible, get out of a classroom. Um, so the purpose is to integrate outdoor learning and connect with the natural world. Our children spend time outside every day. Uh, we're outside at least twice a day, um, and we also have outdoor learning. There's a specific lesson plan one time a week of something that you are actively engaging the children in outside, um, and those activities might be structured hikes and walks. Sometimes it's a purpose, sometimes there's not. Sometimes my children just need to walk in nature. Um, at the beginning of the year, a lot of them don't know how to walk in nature or how to pick up their feet. Uh, there's unstructured free play time in nature. I know at our school we have a little area where we can go and it's kind of surrounded by trees and it's like an outdoor classroom. And sometimes we have a goal that we're meeting according to the lesson. And sometimes it just says go play in nature, build fairy houses, um, find sticks that look like letters, whatever it is. Um, and we bring a lot of nature materials in. Um, so some of the things explored in outdoor learning are senses, your uh, insects, worms and slugs, uh, bird migration, trees at harvest, chipmunks and squirrels, animals and habitats, um, snow and ice, water cycle, signs of spring, colors of nature, winter birds and owls, sun and shadows, ponds, gardening and flowers, animal life cycles, and tree leaves. And then I included some photos. So tomorrow we are going to have Patty Bailey from the University of Maine Farmington come and share with us um, a lot about outdoor learning. She wrote the component for the curriculum. And because I think outdoor learning is going to be an important part of everyone's day this year, as it should be, um, she's going to come and share more about that and how you can make that work in your classroom. Um, so this is her habitat that she built in a center. And then she created clay animals for her habitat. I don't remember what they've discovered, but clearly they've discovered something amazing and they must all look at it. <laughs> um, go ahead, Nicole. This is a self-portrait um, created with nature. It was raining and at our school, we don't go out when it's like a downpour rain and or you know threat of lightning. Um, so we went and we gathered materials previously that week and then had a center in the classroom where they could create self-portraits um, this is her PB. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we uh, were measuring trees and what are some non standard ways that we can measure trees? Let's find families of trees. How can we tell the difference between trees? And so that's what she's doing. Oh, she found the letter H. And we have snowshoes. Um, so we do a lot of snowshoeing in the winter, which is something that's new to a lot of our students, but not all of them. We live in Maine, so a lot of them or snowshoe, um, but for my students this year, snowshoeing was a novelty, and um, 
it was funny to think back to the very first time we did it because I had to like carry them out one by one because I didn't know how to walk in them. But by the end of the winter, really by the time we left school in March, they were frozen. Um, four out of the six units are based in science, so you'll notice there's not a component that says science. Um, it's integrated throughout the entire curriculum, plus these four units. Um, and these guys are testing out what air can move. So they're blowing through the straw, a group of objects um, to see what it can move. And then they were charting it on a platform. So technology is a component that is not in our schedule to talk about these next two days. Um, but I will talk about it a little bit right now so you have that information. It's also on the website, the component that was written. Um, so the emphasis with technology is on interaction between the child and teacher or collaboration with peers using the piece of technology. It's not a passive tool. They're not sitting on apps or playing games. Um, they are, it's not a reward. It's just, if you're offering it, it's a center that you're offering that they can choose to go to. And the technology activities enhance activities that already exist in the, in the curriculum. So in the block center, you're building homes. In the technology component for that week, she was using Osmo to draw a plan for her home, watching the video back, and then using that to build her home with the table block. So if you don't get to it, it's okay, because you're still building homes and making plans in the block center. But here's another way to approach that activity in an appropriate way to use technology. Um, so the technology that we use are digital microscopes, which is my favorite one. I use it all the time in my classroom. Um, iPads with the Osmo and a Sphero, which is a little robotic ball that you can code to do different things. I did not use that this year, just because I don't think I had a chance to. Um, so here's another piece with the the plan. I love this one because he has, you know, these little blocks drawn and then he literally used the little blocks to make his home. Um, I do it with them or sit at that table with them several times before I set up the center for them to use on their own, which is what they're doing. Um, we also have got these uh, lines and curves that you can use to do letters. He wrote potato and then drew a potato. Um, so on those cool. I, I like using them. Yeah. And then there's also epic books that you can do for reading different books. Um, use that. Just go to from your classroom. Um, so she had our technology person at our school come in, introduce epic books, do it with them, and then they could do that as a center. We also have a 3D printer, so we make ornaments and um, one thing I do like about the technology component, because I don't love technology in uh, pre-K, but I'm open to doing it as part of the curriculum. Uh, but one thing I do like is it's not always about using an electronic piece of technology. It's also about the coding and computational thinking that can happen in your brain as you're doing it. And a lot of that happens in sequencing. So, you know, you sequence a story and you're kind of using the technology of your brain to sequence that. She had to put together the process of baking a cake and then go to the dress up area or the kitchen area and follow the process to get the result that she wanted. So. And then you'll find this on the website, but they do have a list of developmentally appropriate resources you can use. And I already shared what we used. We also used Google Expedition, especially when we did Habitat. You can see a habitat in 3D and explore it and see the animals and the plants that are there. They really liked that once, I think they asked for it every day for two weeks straight, even though they already knew where those animals were hidden. <laughs> yeah. So are there, we are going to go into depth for each component over the next two days, but are there any questions right away that you're wondering about? You good? Okay, so um, I'm, let me go ahead and introduce Sarah. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> 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 All right. Um, 
Hi, I am Sarah Smith, and I am a teacher here at RSD 57, my PE pre-K. This will be my third year of PE pre-K, but um, my 16th year of teaching overall. Most of that was in kindergarten, um, and when Waterboro Elementary started a pre-K program in their school, I jumped on the opportunity because I felt like I was getting back to what I had started 16 years ago in kindergarten, more of the teaching of sharing, more of the teaching of collaboration, more of the teaching of social emotional stuff, and that's what I love. So that's why I made the switch from K to pre-K. But uh, the part of pre-K for me that I'm going to be talking about is intro to centers and centers. Um, this I do at the beginning of my day because it's a lot of play. Uh, it's a lot of learning incorporated into that play. So it's that, when are we going to have recess? When are we going to have, what are we with? This is this, here you go. Go play, but you're going to be wrong while you do it. Shh, don't tell. Um, so, do you want me to grab that? It's working now? I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start with intro to centers. So what is intro to centers? Melissa mentioned that intro to centers is a five to ten minute whole group meeting beginning of the year it's going to be closer to five minutes by the end of the year you might be able to stretch it a little longer um, this is where the teacher highlights the connections to the read alouds and demonstrates one or two maybe three new centers that are going to be added to their center time so I am showing some examples I'm making connections to the read alouds that we've been working with um, intro to centers needs to happen directly before center time, so that information is fresh in their brain. If you have a specials or a snack time in the morning, don't do intro to centers and then snack and then centers. You want it like right back to back so that those ideas are fresh in their brain. As you're doing intro to centers, they're going to be thinking, oh, I want to make this block center power with da da da, or I want to go to the easel and paint this. You want to take those ideas while they're fresh and usher them off to do it. So make sure they're right back to back. Calling children to centers. So this is a little different than how I had always done centers. I don't know if you have a free play or a center time in your classroom right now, um, but usually you would go through and say, Johnny, where do you want to go? And Sally, where do you want to go? This is a little backwards. Instead of calling kids and asking them where they want to go, I'm going to call a center and ask who wants to go there. This gives me a little more control. This gives me a little more guidance. It gives me an opportunity to guide them a little more. So if I um, have dramatic play, okay. All right, dramatic play. Today in dramatic play, we're doing caring for babies. And who wants to go there and you've got half the class is going to raise their hand and you know that Melissa and Morgan are not going to work well together in that center so I can call Melissa send her off there call three more and say oh that center's full now but Morgan later you can have a turn there and that way I've kind of squelched some of those social issues that might come up later um, so you're going to hold up your center materials as you call them um, so that refreshes their mind on what is at each of those centers. You always call the most exciting center first. You know, I grab dramatic play first. Why would I do that? Why would I always call the most exciting center first? They're all going to wait for it. Because they're all going to wait for it. And nobody can volunteer for anything else until they know what's happening at that center that they're most excited about. Exactly right. Um, what if a child can't make a choice? What if they can't decide where they want? I would let them see what's left. There's central limits in each center. So if this center's full, that center's full, this center's full, that kind of cuts down on their choices. It's a little less intimidating for them. Um, I will sometimes give them more time and say, okay, well, why don't you think about it? I'm gonna go check in with Jesse and then I'm gonna come back and ask you again. And sometimes they just need that extra processing time to sit back and see what's gonna happen first is room four in the center we have turns lists so this kind of cuts down on that i want to turn of dramatic play 
So I'm going to hover over dramatic play and wait for somebody to leave. That child is not engaged in anything else if they're hovering over dramatic play waiting for their turn. So we have what's called a turns list. And these look different in every one of our classrooms. Some people use laminated with dry erase markers. Some people have lines on their turn. They all look different. Um, but work, use what works for you. Um, after I've called, okay, who wants to go to dramatic play? One, two, three, four. They go off to play. Okay, who wants to turn later? And at the beginning of the year, I write their names all down real quick. And then they know after so-and-so leaves, it's their turn. Cross that name off. After another person leaves, it's the next person's turn. Cross that name off. They also learn that if those four people stay in dramatic play all day today, tomorrow is their turn first. I'm going to carry this over to tomorrow and the next day and the next day until they get a turn. At the beginning of the year, they kind of stress out about it because they don't trust the system yet. But as they see it play out um, time and time again, they are going to become comfortable and know that they will get a turn. And it's okay for them to go to the easel and enjoy that center and go to the classroom library and enjoy that center while they're waiting for their turn at dramatic play. They will get a turn. And often by the end of the year, they are running the turns list. So yes, they, you. they will. They are leaving the center. They will go look at the turns list. They will say, uh, "Joe, you're next in this what center?" And then mm -hmm. you know, they'll move on. So they also, are, I started ready. that by saying that I will write their names at the beginning of the year. This is also an opportunity for them to practice writing their own names because as they're playing and they see somebody made something really cool in the block center. I want to turn at the block center. They will go write their own name on the turn list. Um, they'll count how many names are there. They'll count how many people. So now I've added a little math into that, and I've added a little writing into that, and I've, you know, did so much with just this one simple tool that I thought it would be. And then you'll, you'll be amazed to see how quickly they start recognizing each other's names, not only their own, but they're going to recognize everybody else's name in the classroom, too, so they'll know if they're done and they cross the name on the list, they can go, like, Joe and say, hey Joe, you're next at the drum history. So if you need to keep a record of you know how they're progressing writing their name, you have that. And also in turn recognizing their names, they have an association for letters and letter sounds. Um, oh, you know, it's swivel later, I'm holding up a J and I go, oh, you know, what letter is this? And they'll say, that's in Joe's name. So they'll, uh, they'll 
to turn at whatever. I'm on puzzles and manipulatives. Okay, we'll go write your name. Well, I don't know how to write my name. Oh, here it is. No, that's okay. Um, could you repeat that for the listeners? Because they're having a hard time hearing. Yeah. If I'm not in front of the owl. Okay. Um. So what she's. Yes. Um. She said that she has a um little ring of index cards or some strips or whatever, some sort of way for them to have a model of their name. So when they are going to write their name on the terms list, if they say, oh, I don't know how, you can say, oh, here, Eliza, you can write your name on the terms list. Look at this. And it might not look like this, and you might not be able to read Eliza's name in September or October, but by the end of the year, you can. So and it's great to see that progression. Right, so I've talked about all these things about center time, but I haven't told you what center time is. Center time, during centers, children choose freely and move between activities that support vocabulary development, story comprehension, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. So that's really important. It's free movement. They choose, they have the voice and choice of what they're doing. This isn't a for center rotation, you're in a group, ding, timer goes off, everybody moves to the next center. No, this is a free, their choice of where they go, they choose how long they stay there, and they choose where they want to go next. That's, that's really important. Uh, center activities offer children opportunities to demonstrate their learning through multiple modalities, as well as the ability to revisit work over time. Engagement is enhanced by understanding gained in small groups, let's find out about it, and multiple reads of core texts. So all of those other components of the curriculum are, end up intertwined in center time. So if I, for example, during a math small group, we're working with a bucket balance, later I will add that bucket balance into the Puzzles and Manipulative Center, so they have an opportunity to further explore it and further learn. Um, with it later over and over as many times as they want. So Center Time uses a staggered activity start schedule. So there's some new while others continue from previous days or previous weeks. So it's not every day they come in all new centers. Uh, when they come in a new day, there's one or two new centers, but the rest of them stay the same. This spreads out the prep work for us. Good, very manageable. Um, it reduces the high and low days for children. And so as I said, that um, really super exciting activity and dramatic play, they have multiple days to kind of play that out. Activities are not forced into one mold. Um, so it's not every four days we have a new block center. It depends on their engagement. Um, some last longer than others, and some they're done with in the first day or two. This is what it looks like um, on the website. You can print them. I do print mine at the beginning of the week. So this is, and this is just a piece of it. This isn't the whole one, but um, I print it at the beginning of the week and it, it just, because I work better from a hard copy, I can check them off as I get them done or cross them out as I get them done and circle, oh, I need to prep this because this is what I'm doing tomorrow. And um, so these, are not set in stone, but it's a guide to help you roll out centers a little at a time. So you'll see this is unit one, week one, so this is our very first week. Um, day one, you're going to read Crybaby, and you're going to introduce these two centers. So this is what's at the other centers in the meantime. Day two, you're going to do a first read of Peter's Chair, and you're going to introduce these new centers. This this is continued from the day one. This is continued from day one. So it, you can see this is what else is there in the meantime. So what I'm going to use for an example today is day three. So I'm going to show um, writing my name and family names and caring for babies is what I have prepped here to show you. All right. So how does pre-K for me center time differ from center time in other programs? Pre-K for me is not highly teacher-directed, but it's not free play either. 
So I'm not going to force them to do an activity. I'm going to introduce an activity at Block Center. But if their creative mind comes up with something totally different that they want to do, they're free to do that. This is exploratory learning. So they are free to play out those ideas in their heads. Um, but this isn't Mrs. Smith sits at her desk and works on whatever while they're off playing. Um, usually you have an anchor and a floater, because in pre-K you have two adults in your room. So um, uh, that new activity, I'll be an anchor at that activity, so I'm there kind of guiding them and feeding them some ideas without direct instruction, but just kind of like asking questions and provoking some more thought. Um, while my ed tech will be the floater and she kind of keeps an eye on the rest of the centers for that particular day. Pre-K for me does not offer selected activities for a day. Does not offer selected activities for a day and make children do them all. Okay, so I already said that. This isn't that timer goes off 15 minutes and everybody rotates. It's a more of a free moving. Pre K for me is 60 minutes for a full day or 40 to 45 minutes for a part day. You might think that sounds like a long time, but they need that much time to be really engaged. They need that much time to really get into it and really pull what they're, you know, the highest potential out of it. And uh, as Melissa mentioned, pre-K for me does not combine center time in small groups. Um, this is not a time to pull kids for um, interventions or pull kids for assessments because that is breaking up their engagement. And even if you're not pulling, if I'm not pulling Jessie because she's engaged, but I'm pulling Morgan, I've now interrupted Jessie because they're playing at the same center. And now Jesse wants to know where Morgan's going and why is she going and when is it my turn? And so this is not a time for that. This is a time to be focused on centers and then learning. Yes, well, so same with like if they're getting an intervention, that's really hard because I know special What's that? Repeat the question. Oh, repeat the question. Thank you. Um, so for my friends who are on Zoom, um, she asked, is this not a time to have speech pulled or um, specialized instruction pulled or anything like that? That's exactly what I was going to say. I know that this, our special ed people are on such a tight schedule and it's very hard. I'm not ever going to tell my special ed people they can't pull. That might be my personal preference. If I could avoid it, Maybe, but I know that there's very limited times in the day that they sometimes, have to Sometimes make. our specialists will come during centers and sit at a center yes. with that child. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they, yeah, they can do push in services at that time, which would be great. But that's an option. I have another question. See if I unmute myself and I ask you if that works better. Um, um, can I ask it? So the question is, at the beginning of the unit, when you're only rolling out a few centers, what are you putting in other centers so there are enough areas for all children to play? Mm -hmm. There'll be something there, but it might be something really simple. Um, so if I, at the beginning of the year, and I haven't introduced all the centers, I might just have whiteboards and dry erase markers at the writing center. I might just have blocks at the block center, but I haven't introduced an activity yet. Um, I'm teaching them how, yeah, at the Art Center today, your activity is make sure you get the caps on those markers, make sure you hear that click, you know, so there will be something there so that there is ample activities for everyone in the class, uh, but it's not the high learning, engaged, new, exciting center. <laughs> so what are the centers? We have Art Studio. Easel, writing and drawing, library and listening, puzzles and manipulatives, blocks, discovery or sensory table, and dramatization. I have set up a little mini example of each one of these centers on this far wall. So when we have a break, you guys are can go ahead and check them all out, see some of the activities. I'll be over there. So if you have any questions, you can ask. And here's some pictures of some of my babies. Um, so this is Art Studio. This is the Art Center. Here we're doing some of that um, tinting and shading that Melissa was talking about. This is from our colors unit. 
Here they were mixing colors. So this is also from our colors unit. Here we are making masks, animal masks. So they have paper plates, they have feathers, they have felt, they have all kinds of different materials that they can create wherever their little minds take them. This is the art easel. So at this center, they are doing collaborative painting. So they have to work together as a team to create a picture. Writing and drawing. This was a, a book about friends. And this was the road to the school and they're playing outside. And she can see she wrote some of her friends names. This one, they're writing books. So I took a couple pieces of paper and folded them in half and stapled them to make them books. You can put a colored piece of paper on the outside so it has a cover. They love that. Um, this writing and drawing activity, this you can see a friend has a map of the classroom on a clipboard and they are looking for things in the classroom that are reflective. So he has a flashlight and he has discovered that our door handle is reflective and his partner is circling it on the classroom map that he's found something reflective in. Library and listening. I have a cozy cube in my classroom, which is a big hit. Um, this is, they're doing some research. So these are some nonfiction books about animals. Um, I think these are the swamp animals. I can see the frogs one. Um, and they are, they have notebooks and pencils and they're doing research and they're writing down what they've learned. Some of them it's just pictures, some of them it's just squiggly lines and then they can tell you this says that a frog lives in the water and it has eggs and it has like squiggly lines, but that's fine. That's their research and that's where they are developmentally great. Puzzles and manipulatives. So this is kind of my math-ish center. So you've got your math manipulatives, you have the bucket balance I was talking about. This, it's really important to any of your books that you are using, say if you've introduced a book in Swipple or in small groups and it goes along with this center, put those books at that center. This is a math center, books so fundamentally wrong. They're math books, so you can put math books in a math center. I have building books in my block center. I, you know, wherever you can fit a little extra literacy is a good thing. Um, this is a felt board and it has our five green and speckled frogs, so it's a math song. So it's in with my puzzles and manipulatives and they are free to use that. Here's our block center. We're making a plan and building it. This is their um, rabbit burrows. This, they're doing a stability challenge. So they're building a tower out of blocks and what our curriculum calls beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff is recycled material. It can be cereal boxes, um, paper towel tubes, whatever um, that, they, that they can build a manipulative with, manipulate. So they um, built a tower and then they turn the fan on to test if it's gonna topple or if it's going to be stable. The discovery table, we build sailboats. We have soil and seeds. This, they're washing stains. That's part of our um, colors unit. We put um, watercolor ink on some towels and then they have to scrub the stains. Love they that. love it. It's one of their favorites. Yep. Mm -hmm. So dramatic play. We have some shadow plays happening here. This is a laundromat. So they've got some laundry detergent, and dryer sheets, and laundry baskets, and we took a couple big cardboard boxes and made washers and dryers. This is our flower shop. So you have different jobs. We have a customer, we have a cashier, we have a gardener. Um, what are your thoughts on how to draw kiddos into centers that the students do not seem to go to? Sometimes, um, this is from Jenny Hart, sometimes she'll set up and introduce the center, but students still don't choose to explore there. Um, my biggest trick for that is I'll go sit there. <laughs> or another adult in the room will go sit there, um, and that automatically draws people in, and so that's always a good trick to try. Yep. Yes. Um, so also another component of this curriculum
curriculum is thinking and feedback, where you take a child's work and the whole class looks at it, studies it, and talk about like how they did that, why they did that, what could they do different. So if you use a sample work from that less popular center, it gets everyone excited about it, and tomorrow it'll probably be. And the sample can be a photograph of the child. So what she said was that the sample could be a picture. I'll do a lot of that at the block center because you can't take their structure and bring it to thinking feedback. But you can take a picture and hold an iPad up. I don't because it, it happens that day, and then you're getting feedback on it that you know within an hour. So I don't always have time to run to the printer and print it. But I'll take a picture with the iPad and then hold the iPad up at some time or project it on the screen. All right, so as I said before, it is free flow. Children move from center to center as there is room. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there are limits in the centers. Um, most of them have a limit of four. It depends, um, easel sometimes only has a limit of two. Uh, it depends on your center, and your age in your classroom, how many kids you think will fit in there and be able to appropriately play. And that might look different this year. That will definitely look different this year. You're right. Um, Melissa said it's probably going to look different this year, which I'm sure it will. Um, but we'll see how that plays out. Make a plan accordingly. Uh, children may stay in one center the entire time, and that's okay. If they're playing appropriately and they're engaged and they're learning, feel free to stay there the whole time. And I'm not going to kick them out, and I'm not going to set a timer and say, well, you've been here for 20 minutes. Let's get somebody else a turn. Because they're engaged, and that's your that's always your your main goal. Um, that's what the turns list for. Is if that child stays there all day, then tomorrow they get a you know the other child gets a turn. Teacher controls who goes where during intro to centers. So that's what I mentioned earlier. How you have a little more control by calling the center versus calling the child. Um, teachers keep eyes out for wanderers, which is common in the beginning of the year and. The goal is engagement. So um, like I said, some of them are just overwhelmed and they'll just bounce from center to center to center to center. Um, if that happens, you can kind of guide them and um, ask them some thought-provoking questions or some activity-provoking questions and um, get them going with something so that they can be engaged. I have a question from the chat room. Yeah. Um, is there a limit to how many visits a child can make to a center over the course of a week? And what if a child gravitates back even if starting somewhere else to the same center over and over? Um, that's okay. If that's where they're doing their best learning, that's where I'm going to let them go. Um, I might, if they are constantly at dramatic play and I know that they need a little more math in their life, I might go over there and ask some math questions that have to do with dramatic play. You know, oh, I see you're feeding your baby. You know, um, I see there's some numbers on here. How many ounces are you feeding your baby? One, two, three ounces? Great. You know, like I might kind of give them what they need from where they're comfortable and happy. Sarah, I've even had people ask me before, like, I've had a child start at a center, and they have stayed at that center for almost the entire time of center, and I've had an adult say to me, shouldn't they move on to a different center? But no, if they're actively engaged in what's going on, and they're still learning in that center, they can stay there the entire time. Um, just the next day, I would cross their name off and then start with whoever's next on the terms list. Mm -hmm. um, and very rarely have I ever asked someone to leave a center. I think maybe I've only done that once because of what behavior, but if they, so if they are playing and they are learning still, they can stay at that center with them. And that's another, another point as calling the centers first gives you the control of where they start. So you might start them somewhere else and maybe they write their name on a terms list for the, their very favorite center and they make it back there. That's okay. They gave it a shot. <laughs> Um, so what does the teacher do? They scaffold children's engagement in meaningful ways without coercion or force by gathering information about individual children's interests and appealing to those as entry points for particular activities. So like I said, if they love dramatic play and I know they need some more math in their life, I'll just kind of slide it in there without forcing them to go to the math center. Uh, true engagement with materials and ideas will lead the children to take activities in different directions 
or to use materials in novel ways. So this, I have a little example of, um, I had friends at a block center and making roads or paths was not the activity, but it started and so we went with it. Um, but uh, they are taking turns, um, walking on the path, and then they decided what happens when the path breaks. What are we gonna do? Well, we need to stop people walking on the path so we can fix it. Well, let's make some stop and go signs. So they went to the art center and they need some stop signs and some construction signs, and then they stopped traffic in that one area so that the workers could come and fix their path, you know? That was not in my lesson plan for the day, but that was really neat and they loved it. So we went with it. What does the teacher do? I mentioned some of this already, but we ask critical thinking questions such as, I wonder what would happen if, and what do you think about, as each center activity includes essential questions that help children think deeply about their work. When you get a chance to peek at my centers over here, you can see the white papers that are hanging above them. These are language guides, and it, there's one for every activity in the curriculum, and it gives you some of these ideas, some of these critical thinking questions to ask. It gives you some vocabulary that that lesson is focusing on. Those are so helpful for not only you as the teacher to kind of get ideas on how to engage those kids, but any adult that walks into the room, admin can walk into the room and walk over to Block Center and be like, what are they doing here? I don't, they're just playing, they're not learning. Oh wait, there's a whole list of vocabulary that we're working on. Here's a whole list of what is the point of the center and what are some questions that a stranger to the room who has not heard intro to centers and doesn't know what the lesson is can now be a part of the lesson and can now support that lesson in the few minutes that they're visiting our room. Teachers provide materials to extend, differentiate, or enhance the learning experience. For example, if children in the block center are experimenting with balls and ramps, provide other objects of varying sizes and shapes to roll down the ramp. So they've discovered a new activity. You can say, oh, you know what? I've got this other thing over here in the closet. Hold on, let's add to it. Let's build on it. Let's extend that learning. Teachers review procedures if children need redirection, refer back to a visual scaffold, um, a clipboard with instructions or a step-by-step -step card and model the procedure. Um, you'll also see in some of the centers, there are pictures, they're lower down so you might not be able to see from here, but um, there are some pictures that remind them about the lesson and remind them of what their goal was. So in the block center, they're building towers. There's pictures of different sized and shaped towers from different cities. Um, some in Maine, some not in Maine, some around the world, um, but it just gives them an idea of what they could be doing. Discuss work by noticing out loud something about the child's project. I noticed you use tape to adhere this piece of paper, but you use glue to attach the cardboard. Often just by saying that out loud, it gets that child thinking about why did I do that? And it gets other kids thinking about, well, what's the difference? And, you know, why did they use those different materials? Often children will elaborate on their work when adult comments in detail without judgment. So ask them, what do you want to say about this? Instead of, uh, that's not working, why did, don't, don't judge, don't call them they're wrong. Just say, what were you thinking? You know, why, why, why did you make that decision? Teachers encourage collaboration by supporting children to move from parallel play, which is using similar materials near each other, to associative play, which is sharing materials, which is gonna be hard this year, <laughs> or collaborative play, working towards a common goal, by directing their attention to each other, joining the work for a short time in modeling, or posing a shared challenge. Um, teachers foster problem solving when problems arise, either with materials or with peers. This is really a problem. What do you think you could do about it? Children will often generate acceptable solutions to small problems themselves with just a little scaffolding. Or I'll even, at the beginning of the year, I'll even script for them. You know, I see that you really want to use that block and that friend's not sharing. Maybe you could say, can I use that block when I'm done? And a few rounds of that, they'll, they'll get the idea and 
start doing it yourself. In the schedule is a large group block. There's also a day for social emotional, like classroom stories or like something that's specific to your classroom, um, such as that. So you could bring that example back into that day and talk about how you might solve that problem together in the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that brings it from um, instruction just with that little pair of kids that are having a problem and now you are expanding that lesson to include the whole group and they all have a learning opportunity from it. Another thing that teachers are doing are documenting children's learning as you move around the room. So you have sticky notes, clipboards, a camera, video, anything handy to record dialogue, observation of children's work, learning strategies, social interactions. Um, you can have baskets of materials a little higher up because those are teacher materials versus student materials, which is kind of why I put the language guides a little higher up. They're teacher materials. They're not really so much um, student materials. You're collecting things so you can um, create a portfolio at a later time or saving things for the um, showcase of learning. Thinking document of learning, but that's not the right word. Showcase of learning. But they aren't doing the activity. I touched on this earlier. Um, what if you introduce this really awesome activity and they go over and do something totally different? That's okay. When engaging in activities developed by the curriculum or by the teachers, children should be allowed to add material that are kept in centers to enhance or extend their work. When children veer significantly from the activity, planned by the curriculum or the teacher, the teacher should consider whether or not the child's activity still meets the objective of the learning activity um, and or if it's helping to reinforce the enduring understanding that the original activity or project were meant to teach. So you just got to think, are they learning from this? Are they, are they getting the end point in their own way? Yes? Then we'll, we'll let it go. Are they still learning and actively engaged? Yes? Then continue on. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is from Julie, in so many of the photos that we're seeing, it's so interesting to see time after time that kids are just inches away from each other. Any thoughts on how we can maintain social distance during center activities, even using low numbers, like just having two kids in dramatic play could typically bring those two kids close together. If I had the answer to that question, the entire state would sleep better at night. I don't. <laughs> we're all kind of, you know, we're all kind of working through it and trying to solve that problem. Um, I think uh, collaborating with your colleagues and what's going to work in your classroom might look different from what's going to work in our classroom. I'm sure we're going to have some guidance from DOE and from the CDC um, that also, and from our admin, they've been working day and night on that question as well. Uh, we're going to talk more about how we can adapt pre-K for me to distant learning or some tweaks that we can make in the classroom. Uh, we are going to talk about that later. Uh, so I hope I can I hope I can cover that by the time we're done. All right, so this was an example. This actually happened in Jesse's room. Um, an example of how centers evolve over time. So we started with um, just the basics. Um, so, for instance, for the center caring for babies in the dramatic play area, um, the reading that takes place, all the readings that take place are Crybaby, Peter's Chair, Sometimes I'm Bong Lu, Corduroy, Dello, Goodbye Bundle. Those are all uh, Unit 1 core texts. And the vocab that is used um, is listed here, Quiet, Sleepy, Wooly, Joy, Slurp, Cradle, Crib, Club, High Chair. Um, names of family members, um, words that are used for, while taking care of babies, like lullaby, calm, soothe, whisper, patient, whining, um, different emotions, and many more. So centers, um, the center started out just maybe with babies and bottles and diapers. So they're feeding the baby, they're changing the baby, they're rocking the baby. And then additional books are added to the center so that they can 
um, look at the books and get more ideas about taking care of the babies, but then um, learning about transporting babies, and then they're using the books to read to the babies. And then later, there's writing materials added to the center so that they can maybe write babies' names, or you can give them ideas about um, what a birth announcement is at Let's Find Out About It. So you can use um, like a template for making birth announcements, or just maybe they want to draw their baby's picture and come up with a name for their baby. Um, they can tell stories about their baby. And then the last intro to centers with this, with this taking care of baby center is um, bath time and dressing. So if you have babies that can get wet, you can actually use them in your, um, what do you call it? Your, I just say water. your discovery yeah, center sure. and actually put them in the water with water and soap and washcloths. Or you can do this in the dramatization area where you're just, they're just acting it out. So just empty bins and washcloths and um, empty containers of soap and um, then they can change the dress baby after. So it starts out super basic with just the feeding, holding, and then all of these things are added throughout the course of the year. Thank you. And then those are some pictures. So this was the transporting babies. We had a little baby car seat, and we talked about how you need to bring them to a doctor's appointment, or you might need to bring them grocery shopping, or any of those things, and how can we safely put a baby in a car? What do we need? Um, this was soothing the baby, rocking the baby, putting him to sleep, taking care of him, reading to baby, and that's more transporting baby. There's baby bath time. Those are my baby baby dolls in the classroom you're talking about. <laughs> you, walk by. you walk by and it's like you're looking at it. <laughs> Alright, so um, I mentioned earlier that we do have limits on centers and um, like I said it's probably gonna look different this year but typically I allow four people in my block center um, years past I have had names on clips or pictures on magnets and they put their picture there and that's how they see if there's space left or not I have come to discover they don't need that it's um, it's one thing that you can take off your list, making all those and keeping track of all those. It's one thing that um, they can skip so that they're not so distracted with getting their picture at the right place. They can look at a center and say, one, two, three, four, oh, that one's full. One, two, three, four, there's four kids allowed at this one and there's already four kids there. They can do that. They might need a little support at the beginning of the year, but it doesn't take long that they can figure it out. So you can skip that whole process of clothespins or picture magnets or whatever, and just let them think about it. They can figure it out. And that's hard for teachers who mm -hmm. have used this system for 20 years. It's really hard to let that go. It was very like, hard. There, like that. <laughs> talk a lot about turns list during intro to center so they write their name on the turns list when they leave the center the next person can come they cross their name off when they've had a turn Ooh, I will be right back signs what happens 
if they have to go to the bathroom or if they have to leave the room for speech or they have to, you know, they're going to be pretty anxious about the fact that they're going to lose their spot at dramatic play and they might try to hold it. You might get an accident or you're going to have a kid who's not going to be concentrating at speech because they're missing their. So we have these fun little things. They're called I will be right back signs. Whoops. Uh, I will be right back signs and I keep these in my easel at the front of the room and if they need to go to the bathroom they go over they get an I will be right back sign they put it at their center if they're all uh, working on a block tower and this is my block tower I don't want anybody to touch it I'm gonna put my I will be right back sign right on top of it and all the other kids know there is a student here there is not an available space here these are not blocks that are available to be used I'm holding my place so such a, another very simple thing that really solves a lot of problems in my classroom. Oh, I want to go back. Um, the, the question always comes up with, well, I'm going to put my I will be right back sign at Block Center. I'm going to go to Dramatic Play for a little bit, but I do plan on coming back to Block Center. So that opens up a whole dialogue about if it's fair, you know, what's fair to your friends, and is it okay that you're taking up three centers in the classroom and you're only one person? No, that's not really fair. If you're just going to be gone for a minute or two while you go wash your hands and come back, that's okay. So that also, you get an opportunity to talk about a little bit of fairness and selflessness and kindness. Sarah, do you also have
but there is something there. There is still a block of time called center time. You're still going to do a little mini intro to center so that they can get used to the schedule and get used to the routine. Questions? I know we mentioned that if you have any questions now, please feel free to ask. If you have a question a month from now, two months from now, six months from now, please reach out and ask. Um, I had people from the training last year come and visit my room this winter because they were saying, I tried this and it's not going well. How do you do it? Come on in. I have an open door policy. Um, again, might look different this year for COVID, but I will support you in any way that I can. So here's my email address and feel free to reach out anytime. One thing I will say is just to trust the curriculum. I know a lot of times, I would look at an activity and I'd be like, seriously? <laughs> no one's going to want to do that. And then that was the biggest hit. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you might look at something and question it or wonder why, but do it. Trust the, the curriculum. Follow the curriculum. With fidelity. Exactly. Some things are going to be a bigger hit than others, and that's okay. One year something might not be a big hit, and the next year it will be the best thing that anybody's ever mm -hmm. done. I think those are all good. Um, so now let's get into Think and Feedback. Um, so Think and Feedback is a time for your students to learn from and with one another while they discuss and reflect on a piece of work. It is a group conversation and it involves a protocol that I'm going to share with you today. So we do this right after centers. It, you know, you gathered as a group for intro to centers, you release them to go learn, and then you gather back together for thinking and feedback. You meet in your meeting area. At the beginning of the year, it might just be five minutes long. By the end of the year, we were having 25 minute conversations with them. Um, let's see. So what are you doing for the work? You are choosing an artifact or a piece of work, such as a painting, a sculpture that was created during centers, a written work, you might take a photo of a child doing something and project that up for them or a video. And then you'll have the thinking and feedback protocol. I didn't bring mine from my classroom because my classroom got painted, which is awesome, but all my stuff was all over the hallway. Um, so Morgan sent these for me. And you'll use this protocol. Mine are laminated. I keep them on a ring. They hang on my teacher's easel so that as I guide them through this process, I show them the picture from the protocol. Um, so then I included some photos of some, some of the things I have shared in thinking and feedback. She was making, I put out materials for making wheels and cars and we were learning about ramps. And so she made that and brought that to thinking and feedback. I shared this sign that a child made because I loved it. Um, there of course is the nature portrait. Um, on the far <laughs> right, they built a neighborhood. And so I shared that. And in the middle photo, she was walking around the ice block to measure it. I brought that idea, you know, I brought the photo to thinking and feedback. She shared what she was doing. And then as a group, they came up with the idea of doing that every day and tracking it so that they can see what happens to it. Uh, Art Studio Pizza. He is sorting beautiful stuff, which is that recycled material. I forget what they call it in kindergarten. It's like little stuff, little loose hearts. Loose hearts, yep. Um, and so it's kind of a similar idea. He's take those that was available on the manipulative shelf and he sorted it during centers. A writing sample you might share during this time. Um, I share this photo of this child Spotting the reflection in the pond during a walk. Do you have like protocols for the feedback? Yeah, I'm gonna go through that. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'm just showing some examples of what I would show. Uh, block structure. Uh, this child on the far right, she sorted those fares and materials, and then she labeled them. Um, his book. They're, they're collaborating on a puzzle. So you might show something from one child or you might show something that was a collaboration. 
So during center time, you will choose one piece of work that you will show and they can see that. And it might be just something you liked. It might be something a child would like feedback on. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. It might be something that will support your curriculum. So I had a child who made a book and he labeled all the pictures and I wanted all of my other children to consider doing that the next day in the writing center. So that's what I showed during thinking and feedback. And then the next day, many of them were inspired to go to that center and do that. You might choose something from a center that's not as busy and that other children will want to go to that center to create that work. Or you might choose something that is done by a child who hasn't had a turn yet to share. And I do keep a list of the children and make sure they all get a chance. Um, I always ask if they would like to share. If they say no, I always respond back. Um, so I do have some rules in my classroom for thinking and feedback. Um, we always give kind and helpful feedback. Um, we don't say, I don't like that, or, you know, that should be blue, that color's dumb. We just say, you know, maybe next time you would like to paint it black. And then the child might be like, yes, or no. <laughs> um, we always receive feedback with thanks. So it's your choice whether or not you follow the feedback suggestions, but we're always thankful for the feedback from our peers. We always say thank you for sharing, um, and then they say thank you for your feedback. Um, so the protocol for thinking and feedback is looking at a piece of work, and everyone is quiet, and they're just looking. <laughs> and then they're noticing, and they might raise their hand when they want to share a detail that they've noticed about that piece of work. And they might say, I notice, or I see. And the child who's presenting is still quiet. So they might say, you know, I notice that he used black. I notice their circles. I notice his name. I notice the letters or the materials that they use to make it. And then we are listening and our voices are off and we're listening to our friend tell us about the work that they created. And these are the only first three things I do at the beginning of the year because that's all they can handle. All we can handle at the start of the year is looking, noticing, and listening. And then we thank them and we move on. Um, eventually, they'll also be ready to add on wondering. So you might ask, how did you make that? What materials did you use? How did you know how to make that? Or I wonder why questions. And most of the time we get, I like that, or some form of not a question. Um, and so you can kind of model and guide for them what those questions look like. And suggesting or inspiring, you might say, you might have a child say, I'm inspired to make that. And tomorrow, if they're wandering around at center time, you might remind them, yesterday you were inspired to make a book. Would you like to go to the writing center to do that? Um, or suggestions for them. We can break this down a little more. So when you're looking, you're taking time to observe. When you're noticing, we raise our hand in our classroom and we say, I notice or I see. When you're listening, we're listening very quietly to our friend share. We all, even if one child says, how did you make it? It's a guarantee the second child will say, how did you make it? Mm -hmm. And I often say, remember, <laughs> so and so said they used such and such. And then suggesting and inspiring. So um, thinking and feedback often carries over into the next day. So I may remind them, you know, yesterday at thinking and feedback, Elliot suggested we make block structures more stable by adding more blocks around the base. If you'd like to try this during center, you can do so in the block area. Or I might remind the child of an idea he had during thinking and feedback and provide the material to follow through on that idea. So let me tell you a story about Caden. Here he is. Um, so in unit three, it's wind and water. We read Gilberto in the wind. We learn about the parts of a sailboat. We make plans, we gather materials. We are going to make boats that will float. 
and Caden sure does follow every direction. He gathers all the materials. All his boats have the parts. It has a hull. It has a mast. It has a sail. He brings his boat to the water table. He expects that boat to float, and it just tips right over. He is very sad. Um, tears in his eyes. Comes over and asks me to help him. And instead of taking over that activity or even guiding him in that, I asked him to take it to thinking and feedback and see if he can get some suggestions from his peers about how he can get his boat to float. So we follow the protocol. We look at his boat. We notice the materials that he used. They notice that it's wet. They listen to him share his work, and he tells them that it tipped, and he asks them if they have any ideas. And they wonder why he chose the paper he used. He used construction paper, it's a little heavier. They wonder why he chose an egg carton instead of one of the other options that was available for the hull of the boat. And they wonder, did it tip over right away or did it float and then tip? Maybe that's important. And then they share their suggestions. What about a different hull? That one tipped over, it's not stable. I used white paper, which is lighter, on my boat. Do you want to use white paper too? I noticed the bottom is circle. You can try a different shape. That might float. The sail is way at the top. It's heavy. Heavy it not float. So the next day I reminded him about some of the suggestions and directed him to materials that were available. And he did the same thing. He followed the directions. His boat had all the parts it needed. And he brought it to the water table and it floated. And the look on his face, I will never forget it. He was so happy. And he brought it back to think and came back because this was something he wanted to share with his peers. Um, so they look at his boat. They notice it's a different shape. The old one was circle. It was an egg carton on the bottom. And this one is square. He used a milk carton this time. The bottom is flat. It's in the middle. And when I said, what's in the middle? They said the mast. The mast is in the middle, and that won't tip over. And it's a different paper. It's more sturdy. So the one on the left is his first boat. And then the one on the right was the second boat that he created after getting feedback from his peers and then executing those ideas. There he is. And this was when I fell in love with him. Um, so other things to keep in mind, you're going to phase in each step slowly. I only do the first three steps for the first like six weeks or so of the school year. Um, and then I add the other ones in as they master those steps. You can use a work in progress, similar to Caden's boat, bring it for feedback, and then they can finish the work in progress another day. You can model the good questions that you'd like to hear. How did you decide to sort those materials? How did you construct your boat? What materials did you use? What are you planning to do next? Um, the children do lead the discussion as much as possible. At the beginning of the year, not as much. You are facilitating and modeling a lot of that discussion. But by the end of the year, they really are doing that on their own. Um, in my classroom, we sit in a circle, and I have the artifact. I know in other classrooms, there's a special chair, and that child sits in that chair and has the artifact. You can do it in different ways. How do you do it? Um, my students are just sort of staggered all throughout in the semester. Yes, so first students are just sitting staggered on the rug in their spots, and then the presenter is standing. Sometimes I'll give them the choice. Like if it's a, kind of a more reserved child, they don't want to stand in front of the group, but they want the feedback, so they'll stay in the group. They might they still talk about their art, but they just aren't standing. So Sarah will have them um, have the choice whether or not they want to come up and share in front of the group or if they want to stay in their spot. I give them the choice but everyone wants to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan gives them the choice, but she's never had a problem. Everyone wants to stand up and present. Um, yeah, that's usually how it is. Um, and finally, here are some things I love about thinking and feedback. Um, I've noticed that it helps create a supportive classroom environment and collaborative atmosphere in my classroom. I 
I hear them using the language from thinking and feedback throughout the day. Um, so I had a student, Olivia, who during read aloud, I was introducing Kitten's first full moon, and those illustrations are in black and white. And she raised her hand and she said, um, Ms. Brown, I noticed that the that the author didn't use color, and I suggest next time he do that. <laughs> <laughs> I thanked her for her feedback. <laughs> um, children are engaged in developing critical thinking skills. There's opportunities for self-reflection and problem solving on the work that you're creating. Oral language, vocabulary. They're developing respect for each other's ideas. I mean. I don't know how many adult group meetings you can go into and someone gets feedback and they say, thank you for your suggestion. And it's so collaborative. Um, they're able to accept constructive feedback and give it in a way that's kind and helpful to their peers. And when they carry those ideas into the next day, they have a sense of purpose. Hayden walked into that classroom the next day, he was building a snowboat and there was nothing that was going to stop him. And then there's a video. In that last clip, you may have heard Melissa say that she has a video to share of thinking and feedback. The quality of that video does not come through as clear as we'd like, so that's why I've entered this clip to share it here. In her video, you'll notice that she has gathered her whole class together and is guiding them through the thinking and feedback protocol. She uses the visual aids that are available online and very specific language to encourage and expand student thinking. As you watch, I want you also pay close attention to how Melissa manages her class. How are the children sitting? Where are they sitting? Are there any interruptions? If so, how are they handled? She also mentioned that she believes this video was taken during Unit 4, Shadows and Reflections, which would typically occur around late winter, early spring. I know, that's why I had you kiss your brain. I knew you were going to say that. Right. So it's time for thinking and feedback. So your bodies are still. You're ready. Showing me that you're ready. You're ready, Gabe? Yeah. All right. Because first we are looking, which means our voices are up. And we're really looking. And I'll show you each page. And you're going to think about some of the details that you're noticing so that you'll be able to share what you notice. You're looking with your eyes at this book made by Sully. And now we are noticing. noticing. And you might say, I notice or I see. And if you have something to share, you should raise your hand. Landon, can you sit on your bottom so I can see the friends behind you? Landon, what do you notice? Um, I notice this while watching the book. Say it one more time. That is for the, this is the block in the Sally put some black in the book. I oh, think is thank you. Saying. Sally put some black in the books. Yeah. So you noticed the color. He used a lot of black. Prince, what did you notice? I noticed that. Look to the first page. Sure. I noticed that that is like a building. That it looks like a building. He used a rectangle and a triangle at the top. What do you notice? I noticed that he made letters and that he made animals. You notice maybe some of them look like animals and he labeled <laughs> his pictures with letters. Uh, what do you notice, Madeline? Um, I noticed why it's black and blue. You notice that it's black and blue and green. And it's a bunny. You think it looks like a bunny? I, I know. Ladies and what do you notice? Um, I noticed that one looks like a dog. That maybe one looks like a dog? One at the end. Hmm. That one looks maybe like this one looks like a dog. What's this letter? Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice something? I noticed that he made two dogs. Maybe he made two dogs. We'll hear from him in just a moment. Kaden, did you notice? Um, I noticed um, um, it's a name on the back. 
Oh, there's a word on the back. It is the. Mm. Landon, what do you notice? I know it's this, this is snake in the book. Maybe there's a snake in that book? I just saw one. So now we're going to listen. 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 So our voices are um, off. Sally, tell us what you made today. The first page is a spider. And the picture is a house. It's a house. This one's a teapot. And that's a shadow of a cat and that's a shadow of a human. This is a shadow of a cat and this is a shadow of a human. Tell us the title of your book. Shadow. Shadows. And who is the author? Sully. Sully. And what does it say on the back? The end. The back. And that's the back. That is the back. Because it's the end. So now maybe that you've heard, now that you've heard from Sully, you're wondering something. Like, how did you, or I wonder why? I promise I'm calling you. Chloe, what are you wondering? I wonder, um, I love, um, I love a black and a little bit of blue and a little bit of a green one. Why did you use so much? Because they are shadows. Jackson, what are you wondering? How did you make that? How did you make it? I colored it. And then I colored it in the black. Oh, first he made the outlines of each picture, and then he colored it in with black. Do you have a question? Uh, what are you um, wondering? <laughs> um, I wonder. Um, 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 so much. Um, um, red on the orange and green. You noticed that there's uh, blue and green on the front? <laughs> Well, you could ask him, why did you choose to write your name and title in color? Oh, how did I put it? Why did you choose color for the cover of your book? Because I wanted to. Me. Landon, thanks for being so patient. Are you wondering something? I want it. It's like that is dog and has a teapot to the shadows. They are the shadows of the dog in the teapot. What tools did you use to make your book? Uh, I just used them to help. You just used a what? Marker and paper. Paper. Natalie? Um, how did you make that? How did he make it? First he drew the outline in black, and then he colored it in with black, just like some of the illustrators that we've been studying in our books. Yeah, cat book. Right, just like the kitten book. Okay. Um, you guys are wondering a lot today. I noticed <laughs> that he made a scraper. I noticed that he made a skyscraper, and I noticed that he labeled it with a S. 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 All right, Reds. Uh, I noticed that the skyscraper was different. Okay, are you wondering something? I wonder. Yeah. Uh, Do you have a question for someone? the skyscraper without seeing it. He's wondering how you knew it was those shapes. Well, are you inspired by any skyscrapers you see? Yeah. I where? Saw, I saw some on the documentary. You saw somewhere? 
On a city dock. Oh, documentary. Oh, a city documentary. Also, Reds, if you're looking for inspiration, you can look around the classroom because there's pictures of skyscrapers. Right? All right, so now let's move on to suggesting or inspiring. You might have an idea that Sally could try next time, or maybe you want to tell him, but you're so inspired and you want to try this too. Landon? Um, then, Sally, maybe next time you make a snake book. Pump it. Well, maybe next time you would make a snake puppet book. Or maybe a snake shadow book. Oh, maybe a snake shadow book. Um, maybe we can make a, the same book. Oh, maybe you could collaborate and make a book together. That's a good idea. Maybe he can make a sleeping bat book. Maybe he can make a sleeping bat book. Maybe you could make a sleeping bat book. You're a good author, right? Yes? Um, maybe you can make a bat Mm -hmm. I think, do you guys think he's a good illustrator? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are giving him some good ideas. Gabe, you have a suggestion? Or maybe you're inspired? Um, probably next time you can make a, a sleeping snake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, last book. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> Maybe next time you can make a tower in a book. Ooh, there was a tower in this book. Did you see it? The skyscraper. It's like a tower. But maybe you can make some more. Reds. Uh, I'm inspired, but you should make a hamster book. You're inspired to make a hamster book? I like the no hamster. I think it needs to be super. Alright, we're going to get ready for lunch. Yes. Do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you remember what time of the school year that was by any chance? Yep, that was in Unit 3. No, if you, there are shadows, it must have been the Shadow and Reflection Unit. So it's towards the end of the school year, in the spring. So I, and I'm curious to the group and to those on Zoom as well, feel free to um, unmute if you're so inclined. But to sort of comment on what else you noticed in that video. Outside of the thinking and feedback protocol, um, what else were you seeing that you either have questions about or <laughs> we'll do our own little thinking and feedback for Melissa. Because <laughs> I know I know what I noticed that I love. They're all positive noticing. So I'm just curious if others had anything that you might. Yes. And we talk about this with pre-K teachers so often, regardless of what curriculum you're using, and the importance of sort of the strategy behind using those, what I call big words, right? Children love hearing new big words. So for example, Melissa, I heard you say in that recording, um, you know, you might be inspired to do that. You're a great author too, right? So instead of saying, you're good at writing, you could do that. There's such a huge difference in how you are choosing your words wisely. Um, and this curriculum absolutely lends itself for that. But above and beyond this, there's always a time and place to really strategically use those words. And I heard from the children, even though I know the audio wasn't fantastic, or, you know, them saying, I'm inspired too, right? So now they know, as four and five-year-olds, what it means to be inspired and how to use it appropriately in a sentence. Right? That's so much bigger than just thinking and providing feedback, right? They're walking away with these vocabulary words that are so important. But I have others, so what else did you? Um, sorry, Jennifer, so she 
is loving the noticing aspect about this practice. She feels like the practice of building that skill alone is incredibly helpful for children in their social emotional learning and mindfulness practices. Yeah, and it doesn't, the idea of having the children notice something doesn't just have to happen during the community that time. I mean, it lends itself to outdoor play and interaction. I mean, another huge piece of something that we're trying to make sure gets heard in this curriculum by teachers is the importance of your interaction with children, right? So uh, I think it was Sarah earlier was saying during centers, um, it's not a time for you to be at your desk, right? It's a time for you to be in centers with the students talking and having this back and forth conversation. Outdoor play is not just a time for students to run and get their wiggles out. It's a time for you to be with them and talking and noticing and doing these other things. Yes, of course, we're adults and we need breaks and the children are children and they need breaks from us. So there's, you know, need to a lot for that as well. Um, but I remember, you know, Sue used to always talk about the old squirrel and chipmunk, right? And being outdoors and the importance of, you know, a squirrel running across or excuse me, a chipmunk running across their playground and a student saying, hey, look at that squirrel. And the teacher's job there is to either let it go, which you're doing a huge disservice to that student or their misunderstanding of what the animal was, or stopping and saying, you're right. I just saw that animal run across too, but you know what? It does look like a squirrel. It's not a squirrel, it has a different name. Do you know what it's called? And they may or may not. And if they don't, you might just explain, well, I know a squirrel is usually gray, right? So I have squirrels in my front yard and I wash them in the morning and they're gray and they have a big gray bushy tail. But that animal didn't have a big bushy tail and it wasn't gray, it's a different type of an animal. I think it's called a chipmunk. Oh, chipmunk, yeah. So what did the chipmunk have? That, right, and now this is just outdoor free play. The kid just wants to play and have fun. But it also <laughs> offers that opportunity to be really interactive and purposeful with, with your interaction. Um, something else I want to mention is during read aloud and during thinking and feedback, my assistant, if she's not having to do anything else or sit with a child, has a clipboard and she's making note of anything of it that a child says or does that I can kind of mark off, um, kind of like assessing you, their yes. progress. So, you know, when I asked Sullivan, what is the title of your book? And he, you know, the title of my book is Shadows. And, you know, that's the cover and on the back that says the M, she's marking, okay, he understands, you know, he could answer what is the title, here's the part of the book, and just kind of working towards that assessment piece. Kelly, you were gonna, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just, I also wondered what time in your school year it was, because it was a long discussion, sure. and mm -hmm. they all were in it, and Very they were all raising their hands, which is obviously a school year top of. But then I wondered what time in your daily routine that was happening. Yeah. I know it happens right after centers, but like... So in my out? schedule, we do intro to centers um, at like 9.05, and then we have an hour for centers, and thinking and feedback is right after. Um, I think on that day, I said, let's get ready for lunch. So for some reason, I had to do it. it the day was shifted, probably because Sue Reed was visiting. Um, <laughs> and, but usually, it's right after centers. It was in the morning. He's making a book about shadows. So I'm going to bet that it was in Unit 5. Because he was using the vocabulary from that unit. I noticed more sign language. Um, so really yes. that was on mine too. Yeah. So yeah, she. So the comment was that um, they noticed that Melissa was uh, how she was responding to potential behaviors or interruptions in the classroom, and how um, Melissa was very much. You know, she didn't stop the activity. Right. She, it wasn't a. I'm, I'm going to wait for everybody to be ready. Show me you're ready. Crisscross applesauce, meatball in your lap, all these things that take up time um, that we could be using, right? So instead, it was very obvious that there was one or two students in the front row of Melissa who had something they wanted to say, right? It was a vital part of the conversation, and they weren't going to be able to sit on their bottoms unless they're into That was what I was getting. But instead, and kudos to Melissa for, say, for not doing this, instead of saying what I just exampled, you know, it was a gesture, right? Like she did this soft, like just a minute. And the students, to Kelly's point, this was later in the school year, clearly this is something that they 
seen her do and they've seen other students react to. So in the beginning of the school year, if this is, you know, becomes an issue, I would do exactly like what Melissa said in the beginning of her presentation. You don't have to do every protocol on, you know, week one, right? This happens a little bit later once other routines are, are set. And then she might just do the looking, the noticing, um, and the, what was the third one? Yeah, and, and instead of doing the entire program, as students um, acclimate to that routine as the school year goes on, then they're more apt to be able to sit and follow the directions for the whole time. Yeah. I also noticed how well you validated everything that was done in the class. Mm -hmm. And so I think those details that you were able to get to and student placement? I mean, we could only see a handful in the front. I assume that you had a classroom full there. Any thoughts on that? That surprised you or is not like what maybe you are used to? They were together. They weren't all sitting on us. Yes. So we call that um, so sometimes it's organized, sometimes unorganized stadium seating. So instead of having a circle of students where everybody's on the outside edge looking into the center, um, they sit where they're comfortable, where they know their bodies can be focused and attentive, looking, everybody looking in the same direction. So Melissa may, and you can speak to this if you want to, may or may not use that strategy for every whole group, depending on what you're doing. But for something like this, thinking and feedback, and even for read-alouds, that's a really great setup because then there's none of, you know, if I'm the teacher and students are sitting in a circle and I'm reading a, a book like this, this student here is like this, right, because they can't see versus where we're like this and I'm showing you the story, everybody has a visual, um, you know, they can see what's happening here. Um, so I, I don't know how that's no, I do always... both. Um, mostly do stadium seating. Um, because I like my children to be able to see what I'm doing, but also have the autonomy to choose where they want to sit. That will probably look a little different this year because they were sitting pretty closely together. Um, I'll probably, and I can't have the rug in my room, so I'll probably have spots that I set out and affix down and that are appropriately distanced with their names on it. I'll move them around so they're not always sitting next to the same person. Um, it'll we also do circle seating. At yes. that time, I didn't. Um, but sometimes do circle seating. We use stadium seating for storytelling and story acting because we're an audience watching the show. Um, but yeah, I find that most effective. And I had the students I knew could respond to and be guided by my gestures right up front with me. Um, and then there was one child you couldn't see. Well, you can see his hand at one point, like waving, um, who was sitting with an adult because that's just the, the support that he needed, and that was okay. And he still shared and was super engaged. Um, you might have students who don't raise their hand at all, and that's okay too. Um, we we celebrate when someone who hasn't talked all year finally raises their hand and shares something they noticed. We're so excited. <laughs> Is there anything from other books or online? Or? Okay, good. 